In Acts 10 and 27, Jesus speaking, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So here we can see that God is speaking to us. And we started this study several weeks ago saying that this is the 800-pound elephant that most Christians want to talk about, but they're not quite sure where to begin or where to start. And so we began several weeks ago saying that God desires fellowship. He wants to commune with us. He wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. He wants to guide us in paths of righteousness for his, his namesake because he is our good shepherd. And therefore, if he is leading and we are following, Scripture says he knows us, he calls us by name, he goes before us, and we can follow him. In the voice of a stranger, we won't adhere or submit or follow and this is a very important principle because some people believe that God has spoken, but they don't know that God still speaks. They believe that, yes, in times past, in various ways, and in numerous and various forms that God spoke unto his people, but they're not quite sure how he's still continuing to communicate or speak unto them. And there are a lot of different ways in which the Lord is endeavoring to get our attention. And here's one of the things about life that's common to all of us is that we learn by looking back, but we live by going forward. And we looked at the life of Jacob, and Jacob was unaware that God was talking to him until he looked back. He was going somewhere. He had something to do. And yet in that season, in that moment in his life, he was unaware that God was talking to him. We also looked at the life of Samuel, and Samuel was uh, called to be a prophet, and yet he didn't recognize God's voice initially until he received some further instruction. Then he was able to understand that God was talking to him. And sometimes we need help in discerning, is that the Lord? Is that just me? Is that just, you know, uh, the season that I'm in? What, what could it be? And, and many times when we have people that are around us that, that uh, we can begin converse with, they would say, no, that sounds like it is the Lord, and, and uh, just continue to listen. I, I, I was encouraged also as I uh, reminded you about the life of Saul who became the Apostle Paul, that he really was a man on a mission. He just didn't know that he was on the wrong road and that he was doing things improperly until God got his attention. Then his response to the Lord after he revealed himself on the Damascus road is, Lord, what would you have me to do? So that is one of the great truths about life, that we live going forward, but we learn sometimes by looking backwards. And the Lord is not there to chide us or condemn us. He's there to lead and to guide us and to comfort us in all seasons of life. Let's talk about the definition of awareness once again. It's when we become enlightened that something is happening or that something exists. This is paramount because if we don't have an awareness of something, we can't begin to acknowledge it. Those that do therapy and those that help people that have addictive disorders and dysfunctions in their life say that if we can help them to become aware of what's going on, then they can take the first step in getting healthy, and that is to acknowledge it. You know, I can't acknowledge the Lord as my Savior till I'm aware that I need him. Once I'm aware that I need Jesus, I can acknowledge him as my Lord and Savior. This awareness issue is such an important piece in us understanding that God really is more a part of our life than what we even understand or recognize. And so uh, as we become aware of something, uh, this could be situational, outward, inward, seen, and unseen. And this is where we're going to dive down, get a little bit more specific with some of the ways that God does speak to us. Once again, in studying how God speaks to mankind, the Bible and prayer are fundamentally accepted as the foundation of this truth. And I've given you some supportive scriptures there. Then I've written out this path to God's blessing. It begins with awareness, then we're awakened. It creates a willingness, which causes us to be obedient. And obedience, once it's invoked in our life, brings the blessing of the Lord. 
let's talk about the way that God continues to speak to us. And as a reminder, last week we looked at He speaks to us through creation. We looked at Psalm 19 and said that He is speaking to us through all that He has made. And everything that is made was made by someone that we don't see, but His attributes and His characteristics are thoroughly understood by everything that is seen. I like to think of it in a very simple way that the sun says good morning and and it also says good night. And in a way, God is using that to communicate his faithfulness and his steadfast love towards us. There's so many other things that we can attribute to how God uses creation to create an awareness in us. We also looked at conscience. And, and conscience is an interesting study in the word of God because it's that fine line between your spirit and your mind. It, it really... Uh, it sort of pricks and, can, and, and is a part of both according to the word of God. But most people, uh, when they're conversing with us, may not recognize that God is talking to them, but they're uh, aware at a conscious level that they need to do something different. And many times it comes out in the form of a confession. I'll give you an example. I was visiting with someone recently, and they said, you know, I know that I need to be in church. I know I need to be gathering with the people of God. What was going on at that moment was they were aware that their conscience was dealing with them to do something that they knew that they needed to do. And that's many times God speaking to us. They may have just thought, well, maybe I'm just missing it. Maybe I just, no, that's God speaking to people. People that say, you know, hey, I know I need to be more involved in the life of my children. No, I, I know I need to be reading my Bible more. No, I need to be praying more. I, I need to be more active in being a witness for God's glory. And, and what that's conscience. That's an awareness that we need to be doing something, and we just need to acknowledge the Lord and then follow through with obedience, and then the blessing will take care of itself. Can I get an amen? And then Christ speaks to us. We talked about the glorious ways in which Christ came and what he did, what he accomplished, and where he is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. Christ is definitely communicating to us through his coming, through his life, through his ministry, through his suffering, through his glorious resurrection, and by his spirit, he still speaks to us. Today, let's take a look at conviction. Number one, another way that God talks to us in as I get into conviction, let me remind you that if we're not listening to creation or we don't listen to our conscience or we don't listen to Christ, then there comes this cutting of the heart called conviction. And let's look at John's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus describing the importance of the Holy Spirit in his ministry. We are going to to pick up in the eighth verse. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler or the prince of this world is judged, talking about the devil. I, have, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Listen to the specifics about Jesus communicating not only about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but about his ongoing willingness to communicate to us. He says, you know, I want to talk to you about this specifically, the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because I'm getting ready to leave. But don't be concerned. I'm sending a helper. I'm sending a comforter. I'm sending my spirit, someone who is just like me, who will continue to be with you just like I'm with you, who will continue to be a part of your life just like I'm a part of your life. And I have many other things to say to you. Well, how's he going to say it to us if he's not here? He's going to say it to us by his spirit. And what is his spirit at times doing? It's convicting us. His spirit is convicting us. Another word for conviction is convincing us. Well, he's convincing me that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. He doesn't leave me guilty like you're a horrible sinner, a horrible human being. 
Oh, I don't need the Holy Spirit's help with that. I'm, I'm quite aware that I'm, I'm somewhat laundered and need to be cleaned. But I don't have the capability of doing it. So he convicts me of my sin and he convinced me of my unrighteousness that, wow, apart from God, you are filthy. And then he convicts or he convinces me of judgment that there is a pending judgment and that day awaits each and every one of us and he wants us to be prepared for that day. He doesn't want us to be scared in that day. And so he's working to convince and convict us. And what does it feel like? I love what the book of Acts has to say and we're going to get there in a minute. It, you, but, but let me go back here. Jesus is now speaking to us and continues to speak to us by his spirit. And one theologian made this outstanding observational statement. The letters to the church are Jesus' unuttered words that he was not permitted to speak and now by his spirit has spoken through others so the church can have the rest of the story. Woo, that's good. So how's Jesus continuing to speak to us by his spirit? And one of the ways, of course, as we said, is through the Bible because the Bible is God talking to us. So the letters to the church are the unuttered words of Jesus, the words not spoken by Jesus while he was here. He didn't have permission to talk about these things, but he inspired others by his spirit to write so that we could have the rest of the story. And what is the message in the letters to the church? That our Jesus is risen and in him we have a new life. In Christ, we are more than conquerors. It is a message of complete redemption. So the letters to the church are something that we need to be immersed in because it continues to reveal unto us the will and the ways of God for our life. Acts chapter 2, if you'd follow me to this portion of Scripture, Acts chapter 2, we're going to see a phrase now that you several times and maybe you've run across it in your Bible reading and pondered or wondered, you know, what is this referring to? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. And this is Peter, and he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, here's the phrase, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They felt something in their heart. And then they asked the question, wow, in light of Jesus being the Messiah, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. They were convicted. They were convinced by the Holy Spirit at that moment that they needed to make a decision for Jesus. They needed to make a decision pertaining to the things of God. It goes on in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent or turn around and face God. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Conviction is like all other aspects of walking with God and listening to God and responding to God. It's still a choice. God doesn't make us. God convicts us, but he doesn't make us respond. But when you feel that cutting of your heart, that knowing that you need to respond to the word of God or to the call of Christ upon your life individually, then the, the next best question is, Lord, what should I do? Many times it just means change your mind about what's going on, turn around, face Christ, and accept his way of living. The second way that I want to talk about the Lord talking to us is one that we in full gospel circles sometimes don't delve into this water too deeply. And yet there is a truth throughout scripture into chance. And some people say, I don't believe in chance. I, I, I don't, 
I, I'm not going to, you know, buy into that, you know, kind of thinking or that kind of belief. Well, when you understand what chance is and what it isn't, you may change your mind. So let's stay open and receptive here. So God can talk to us through conviction. We can see that through the Holy Spirit because Jesus still has many things to say to us. He can also talk to us by chance. Let's, first of all, define chance. It's an opportunity that happens without being deliberately created. In other words, you and I are not aware of it. We're oblivious to it. The opportunity occurs as the result of God's timing. Not us, him. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. Listen, but time and chance happen to them all. Things aren't always what they appear. And there is time and there's chance that happens in each and every one of our lives. We might reframe those words and we would say there's open and closed doors to everyone's life. Or there's opportunities. And, and, and once again, we live life going forward, but we learn by looking back. In your life, can you see that there have been times where God's timing was opening a door or a chance or an opportunity for you to say or do something, and you weren't quite sure it was him speaking through that particular, in that particular moment. So you just, by chance, continue to walk by and didn't intervene or didn't do something or say something. I can look back and say, wow, okay. That was the Lord opening a door. I didn't do it. The Lord did it. He's the one that opens and closes doors. Let's take a look now over into the New Testament. If you would, go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And we're going to see an example of chance in Scripture. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Let's pick up on the 30th verse. Jesus was asked by a lawyer who was testing him, who's my neighbor, Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. It was not the man's fault. He was going somewhere to do something, and he got accosted. He got mugged. And now he's on the side of the road, and he's really in poor condition. Verse 30, Now by chance... It wasn't on this man's calendar that, that something would happen to him as he was going about his responsibilities and taking care of his affairs, but something happened to him. And now by chance, it says, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, or in the same way, or by chance, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. So he's had people walk around him in both directions. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, by chance, or through the same opportunity of time that God had created, this man, this Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The others saw him, but this word saw here means he became aware that this man was in poor condition. If not given support and help, and someone doesn't stop and do something, not only would he lie there and continue to suffer, but he may not have any life within him by the time the sun goes down. So this man is in need of someone being aware of what's going on. Two of the people that maybe should have been aware were not aware, and one that we would say maybe wouldn't even care, did care, and was aware. So we have to be careful about this situation with chance because chance happens to all of us. 
we didn't initiate it. It wasn't deliberately set up by us. It was something that time took care of. In time, in life is how we would define that because the working definition I like of time is God has given us a tool called time for several reasons. But the primary reason that God uses time is because he doesn't want everything to happen right now. He uses time in ways that are beyond our comprehension, and yet he's speaking to us through time or chance if we're discerning and sensitive to his promptings. So those that maybe were equipped and ready to help didn't take the time that chance gave them Someone who was just as busy as those that were trained and equipped took time and made the most of the chance that was given unto him. He recognized God speaking unto him. That he should be his brother's keeper. That he should care for those that are hurting. That he should not just go and walk around when he has the means to do something to support someone. And all of us can look back now and say, wow, I can see now where God had given me a chance to be involved and I just didn't take the time. I had the time, I didn't, I didn't take the time. God wouldn't put us in those positions if he wouldn't help us to redeem the time. If we would just give it to him, we would be amazed at how much more gets done. How many of us squeeze God out of our life because we have things that we have to do and places we have to go and things we have to accomplish? And yet, by doing that, just like these individuals, God was wanting to speak to us so he could help somebody who couldn't help themselves. This man could not help himself. He was helpless. He needed support. Someone had to give time in order for his wounds to be healed. It took several days. We know the end of the story. And, of course, we're thankful that Jesus said, yeah, blessed are you if you do this. So the awareness in this Samaritan awakened him. He became willing to spend and be spent of his own money, his own resources. He was obedient and Jesus said, this man was blessed. That's a category that most people are longing for. You know, I want the blessing of God in my life, Pastor. I long for the fullness and the goodness and the overflow of God's blessing in our life. Then are we aware that when he is speaking, not only through the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we would turn and face him and turn from our ways and accept his ways, but would we be aware of opportunities he's given us to those that can't help themselves that need our support or help? Just something to ponder, isn't it? I want to encourage you when it comes to chance, as I did with conviction, that this once again is a choice. We could choose to walk on either side, but there's also the opportunity to stop and to lend a helping hand. It's a choice. When we pray and dedicate our day to the Lord or we consecrate ourselves to the Lord before we walk out the front door, be aware that he might talk to you and I through chance. When you give him your time, and another way to think about time in a very simplistic way is, that's my life. My life is made up of times and seasons. Time is something that we all relate to, but are we listening when time is speaking? That could be God talking to us. Have you ever felt like, you know, it's time for me to do this? It's just time. It's time. Time is a wonderful instructor if we're a good listener. You may have good ideas, I may have good ideas, or even God ideas, but the timing of it is paramount. So it's so important that as we wake up every day that we have this willing 
heart that says, God, whatever you have for me to do today, wherever you would want me to go, my life is in your hands. Thank you. And I pray that I would have discernment and understanding that if you speak to me through time or chance, that I would respond, here I am. I can do something. The third way that I want to talk about today is through circumstances. We want God to change our circumstances, and sometimes God wants to change us in the midst of our circumstances so we don't look at them negatively but positively. How many of you have asked God to change your circumstances? And many times you feel like the circumstances haven't changed. What's up, God? Can we talk about this again? And the circumstances haven't changed. But God may be changing our mind about the circumstances and then the circumstances do change because we look at our circumstances through a different lens. Circumstances, what are circumstances? Circumstances occur when we are aware of our surroundings and opportunities. Chance happens when we're not aware. Circumstance happens when we are aware. Thus, we ask God to change them. I don't like my circumstances. I don't like my situation. God, I'm asking you to change them. And God many times is saying, the circumstances aren't your mountain. You might be, and I might be, the biggest mountain that needs to be moved. So why? We can see if a mountain or circumstances are keeping you from seeing things clearly, then get on the other side of the mountain or view it from a different lens. 1 Thessalonians, if you would, chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in the 15th verse. Read down to the 22nd verse. Tremendous exhortations given to the church. And he's talking here about situations that we're aware of. Verse 15. See that no one renders evil for evil. So someone does you wrong, you're aware of it, and you pick up the sword to strike them back. He says, no, that's not the way that you handle the circumstances. No one renders evil to evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. And that is tremendous counsel. If you and I live by the sword, we're going to die by the sword. If we pick it up and strike somebody else, that same sword is going to come back and pierce our heart. Because there are what? Consequences for poor choices. If you don't like your circumstances, if something's happening and you're... He continues on and he says... In verse 16, rejoice always, that's in all circumstances. Pray without ceasing in all circumstances. In everything or in all circumstances, give thanks. Why? This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit under any circumstance. Do not despise prophecies at any circumstance, test all things, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil or darkness or wickedness. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. This is Jesus talking about the judgment of the nations and how things will be done in a righteous way. Verse 34 then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. God has something prepared for each and every one of us. It's ready to present unto us. It's been there for a long time. Verse 35, for I was hungry. And you notice the tense? He says, I was hungry. So this is judgment. This is we've lived our days our days are gone. We're standing before the Lord. And he's going to say to each and every one of us, I have something prepared for you. It's been prepared since the foundation of the world. 
and I want to distribute it unto you, but it's according to how you responded to me speaking to you. Were you obedient? And obedience is going to bring a blessing. And these people are now standing before him, and he's conversing with them. He says, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. You were aware that someone was hungry, and you did something about it. The circumstances, you were aware someone was hungry, and you didn't walk by. But you stopped, and you said, hey, I've got some I've been blessed by the Lord, and I'm blessed to be a blessing. Therefore, I'm going to do something about it. So there was something that these people could have and should have, and they did do. He said, I, I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Scripture says that many of us have entertained angelic beings or, or heavenly hosts, and we were unaware of it. There are these circumstances that happen in life, and through these circumstances, God is speaking unto us because we're the ones that many times have prayed and asked Him, Lord, we want to be a blessing. Help us to serve those. And the package isn't always real pretty. People that are hungry aren't always the most tidy and, and, and uh, complimentary people. If you help people that are hurting, hurt people sometimes lash out and say and do things. If you give them something, you may have to be, get ready that they may not appreciate it or they may want something different. There, there was a man years ago that came into the church and he needed some food. I said, I'll be glad to go grocery shopping with you. So we went to the grocery store and I said, what are some of the things that you need? And I said, I, I think when I go to the store, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and I, I shop accordingly. So what do you like for breakfast? And, and we sort of went down that row and got him some things and and I was trying to say, we have X amount of dollars, so let's sort of con you know, consider that as we're putting it into the cart. And so I convinced him that you can make a lot of pancakes with Aunt Jemima uh, uh, pancake. You can make a lot of, of oatmeal, and, and, and uh, you know, eggs go a long way, and they're not that expensive. They weren't back then, and before we all got into the chicken industry. And, and so uh, we, we get, and now we're at lunch, and at, at lunch, he, 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 we're going by uh, the deli area, and in it is all of these choice cuts of meat and all of this really you know, well-prepared uh, uh, food, and, and he's looking at it, and, and, and I'm trying to say, we need to keep moving. We need to go somewhere, because we only have so much money, and he says, you know, hold on, hold on, hold on, Pastor, hold on, hold on. And I said, all right. He said, you, look at that. Look at that. I said, yeah. I said, would you look at that? He got all kinds of choices there. He said, you know what I need? I said, what do you need? He said, I need some lean cuts of meat. Lean cuts of meat. I said, lean cuts. How much per pound is the lean cuts of meat? And so we looked at the lean cuts of meat. They was quite a bit per pound. Compared to the aisle I was taking them down was the frozen dinner aisle. You know, you can get a lot of pot pies. That day, it was 10 for $10. That's just a dollar a pie. Now, that would have gone a lot longer than some lean cuts of meat. I said, if I get you some lean cuts of meat, you know that we're about at our budget. I need some lean cuts of meat. Sometimes when you're helping people, they don't recognize help. People that are hungry, people that are thirsty are grouchy. All we have to do is look in the mirror and say, hello, grumpy, when we're not getting our palate fed the way we want it or we're not getting the water or the nutrients that we like. Have you ever offered someone at your house through hospitality, hey, these are our choices to drink. I don't want none of that. He said, oh, okay. What do you want? I want this. So be prepared that when God speaks to us, it's not always immediately an enjoyable set of circumstances. Through inconvenience, God might be, you know, forming and shaping us to become more servant-like and more Christ-like. And he goes on and he tells them in verse 36, I was naked and you clothed me. Well, that's somewhat concerning. Didn't have enough clothes. 
or they didn't have any clothes at all. And that's a felt need and could be met. Strangers, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Yeah, that's God talking to us. Then the righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? Verse 38. When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, this is God speaking, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. What a test. You know, there's, there's, Believers that are hungry and thirsty. You know, some believers, because they're in the process like the rest of us, don't always make great decisions. Some struggle with sometimes just obeying the law. They end up in prison. They're still God's people. He still loves them. He just wants someone to go visit with them because maybe they're just covered in shame and guilt and maybe they're just buried underneath, you know, the mountain of regret and don't know where to go and, you or I came, and it was, they said, no. It was more than Pastor Drew, or it was more than Mike, and more than Joe, more than Rick. It was more than Marty. It was Jesus that came to me. You know, strangers to us aren't strangers to God. God knows no strangers. They may not be familiar to us, but God is very familiar with them, familiar with their circumstances, and through their circumstances, might be talking to us to help them. So we live life going forward, but we learn by looking back. Can you see that God's been speaking to you more than maybe at times we've even recognized? Through conviction, that cutting of the heart, stop, turn around, say, God, your ways are the best ways. I'm sorry for running. I'm not going to run from you. I'm going to run to you. Maybe it's, it's been through chance, and you just thought, there's no such thing as chance. That's like rolling the dice. That's a lucky rabbit's foot. No, God gives time, and through time, he gives us chances to do something. We were unaware of it, but when we became enlightened, we could do something. We should do something. And then maybe through circumstances, and maybe you don't like the circumstances, Maybe it's hard to associate with the humble, which each and all of these are in that category. But when you know that Jesus is the greatest servant of all, it's easy to humble ourselves. I can, I, you just have to consider him. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641 828